Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. For those that are interested in structure, it's interesting how these chapters are symmetrical. Chapters 9 and 10 correspond, in a sense, to chapters 1 through 4 of the book. Chapter 11, that we studied last time, to chapter 5, the judgments upon the unbelieving nation, uh, displayed in the rejection of the Messiah that we covered when we covered chapter 11. And chapter 14, up to 14, will be chapter 6, 1 through 8. There's parallels anyway. It's interesting that the day of the Lord is a term, it's amazing from how many pulpits you can hear fuzziness as to what that really refers to, and the scripture is quite clear. The day of the Lord occurs 18 times in the book of Zechariah. And when we studied Joel and studied Malachi, Zephaniah, all of those, uh, we got quite a bit of emphasis on that, a very key period in God's program. Turn to Matthew 24. Remember the confidential briefing Jesus gave his four disciples that came to him for a briefing on the second coming. And obviously we can't go through the whole thing, but he talks about the abomination of desolation. The key verse in this chapter 24, of course, is Matthew 15. Jesus tells them, when you see this strange thing, this thing called the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, then you are to split and split now, and he gives them a number of instructions. Because he gets to verse 21 in Matthew 24, he says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time known nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Heavy stuff. They're going to experience a time of tribulation such as the world had not seen to that time. Now, wait a minute. Boy, the world has seen some tough times, and Israel especially. What about the Holocaust in Europe? You mean there's going to be another one? Yes, we're going to learn a lot about that in chapter 13 of Zechariah. But in any case, this great tribulation, we hear that phrase among Bible scholars all the time. A very specific period of time. Where does Jesus get this phrase? Turn to Daniel chapter 12. In a sense, Jesus is quoting Daniel 12. Daniel chapter 12 opens up verse 1. Speaking, it, it, verse chapter 11 had detailed the career of the Antichrist. He should come to his end, but none shall help. And then chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince who standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time... Thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found, written in the book. So here is a phrase that echoes uh, what Jesus mentioned in, uh, in Matthew 24. There shall be a time of trouble, and this is implicitly to Daniel, to his people, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Now, there's another place that this is discussed, and that's in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30. And this is perhaps a very key phrase that may illuminate some of the misunderstanding about this peculiar period of time that's so prominent in the Scripture. In, in Jeremiah chapter 30, starting about verse 5, For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling. Remember that word. We're going to encounter it in Zechariah. Voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in travail, and all faces turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The time of Jacob's trouble, that's an Old Testament phrase for the period that we're dealing with called the Great Tribulation in the New Testament by Jesus, quoting Daniel in effect. But when we see it phrased that way, it, it's, a, it's perhaps a little sharper in focus, a time of Jacob's trouble. Remember Jacob had his name changed to what? Israel. It's interesting how when Abraham's name was changed to Abraham, from the day the name was changed, that he was always Abraham, wasn't he? And uh, you can go, how about Saul of Tarsus? He was changed to Paul. From that day on, what was his name? Paul. Never saw him again. That's usually the case, but there's a couple of exceptions. Remember, Simon was changed to Peter, right? 
Was he always called Peter? No. Sometimes he's called Simon. And if you study your text carefully, you'll discover that he's called Simon when he's acting in the flesh. And he's called Peter when he's responsive to the Holy Spirit. We also notice Jacob had his name changed to Israel, right? But we also notice there also, as you work through the Old Testament, speaking of the person, when that when the word is used of the person, uh, Jacob, uh, he's called Israel when he's walking in the Spirit. Most of the time he's called Jacob. That's right. And um, it's interesting that um, Jacob seems to spend a lot of time conniving, a lot of time being in the flesh, right? We hear the God of Abraham, Isaac, and strange, isn't it? It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's what you'd think, wouldn't you? No, he's in the flesh a lot. And take comfort in that, because if God can justify Jacob, there's hope for all of us. Huh? And so, so, I might mention that this chapter, chapter 12 of Zechariah, surprised you, we're going to get right back to it. You didn't think we would, did you? Chapter 12 has a number of key words. The word Jerusalem occurs ten times in just this chapter. And there's another phrase that occurs seven times, in that day. In that day. What day is he talking about? The day of the Lord. When he says the day of the, the word yom, the word day, is not necessarily 24 hours. It can be. But it's also a day, a period. We could speak of uh, the day of FDR in the United States history, or the day of, you know, in other words, the word day is a, can be alluded to as a period of time. And uh, the day of the Lord isn't a 24-hour day, but it's a very specific period of time that's forthcoming. And uh, this has much to say about it. Well, let's just jump right in. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. This is a burden, a masa. That's a term you're familiar with. If you've been reading prophetic literature, it's a, a burden, a, a heavy, a heavy, minatory kind of passage. But it's interesting how it opens up. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Boy, what a sweep. Embracing the dimensionality of space. Uh, and we could talk much about stretching forth the heavens. I encourage you to dig into that. These three participles, by the way, imply continuous action, not once and for all kind of language. God is sustaining constantly his creation. Isaiah 42.5 and Isaiah 44.24 are, are, are allusions here, if you will. Now this majestic introduction to this heavy chapter, I believe, is intended to dispel doubt and unbelief concerning the predictions that follow. This is to remind us who is speaking. This is this allusion to the majesty of God is, is uh, to emphasize he's abundantly able to carry out what he proposes to do. Then he continues verse 2 and 3. An interesting, strange passage actually. God says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Interesting passage. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. A goblet of staggering is rendered by some. Now a cup is a well-known symbol of God's wrath. And Isaiah, well, there's a bunch of verses I won't bore you with. We have them in the notes for you. Now it's interesting. Jerusalem be a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. Now if this was all that was there, you'd say, well, that's just its neighbors. It's always been a thorn in the sides of its neighbors. Well, I think the scope of this is far... Uh, more. And it says, when they shall be in siege against both Jude and Jerusalem. Let's look at verse 3. And in that day, God says, and in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be torn in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. You notice it says in that day again. Here's that phrase. It's synonymous with the day of the Lord. And this is going to reverberate through not just this chapter, but the following concluding chapters also. A burdensome stone that anyone that tries to pick it up will be torn in pieces. And this is almost trying to describe a global hernia by the nations that try to deal with it. Seriously, I know it sounds funny, but that's the idiom used. A burdensome stone 
you, you know, you don't think of a stone when you try to lift it as tearing you up. You follow me? But that's exactly the imagery that's being used here. Those that would crush God's people are going to be crushed by Jerusalem. That's what's going to turn out to happen here. But the key phrase I want you to think about is all the peoples of the earth. This is not a local or regional issue. Now, as we talk here, think quickly about the predicament of Jerusalem today. You know... And one of the things I want to emphasize, if we just stop from reading the scripture here and get our, think about it a minute. Is there anything more absurd than the city of Jerusalem becoming a world issue? Now, uh, there's no reason for Jerusalem to be globally significant. It has no natural resources. There's no river, no harbor, no, no intrinsic strategic significance. It's not on any key trade routes. In ancient history it was, but not today. In fact, it's significant only to a few religious groups. It's, of course, um, very dear to Jews. Not all of them. Actually, a minority of them. To hold it very, very dear. It's significant to the Muslims, but uh, only since they recognized that it was significant to the Jews. No, really, they, they controlled it for over a thousand years, and it turned to rubble. They didn't even bother to visit much. And uh, fell into disuse and disrepair. When they realized its significance to the Jews, then suddenly it became the third most holy site in Islam. What about Christians? We love to visit it for lots of reasons, but not to die for. But take all of those and put them in one pot. Take all the Jews and Muslims and Christians, and as a proportion of the world, it's a drop in the bucket. Especially a world that is non-religious, a-religious. Why would the entire world be in siege against Jerusalem? It's patently absurd, and yet, at this very moment while we're doing this study, around the world, the late lights are burning in every staff group that is, every nation of international significance, as they struggle to figure out what position to take relative to the issue of Jerusalem. I wonder if the time is getting close. I think little do the nations of the world, and the United States in particular, have any idea how they incur the wrath of God against them when they touch the apple of his eye. That's a phrase you may recall from Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. That's also drawn from Deuteronomy 32.10. Does God care about Jerusalem and Israel? You bet. The nations that even muck around in that area are incurring his wrath, let alone those that seek to wipe them off the face of the earth. It's going to get exciting. Trust me. (laughs) Trust him, not me. Excuse me. (laughs) You know me well enough not to trust me. Yes, sir. (laughs) Continuing in verse 4. In that day, there's that phrase again. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Now this idiom of horse, or sus in the Hebrew, is is an idiom, if you will, for military force. Cavalry, of course, was one of the primary... uh, elements of warfare in that day. I personally believe the term is used idiomatically here as it is used in many, many prophetic passages as a symbol of warfare type power. Now these three plagues, smiting the horse with astonishment and madness and blindness, are the same three plagues that are alluded to in Deuteronomy 28, 28. If you recall that in Deuteronomy 28, that's where the blessings and the cursings were enumerated. If they were obedient, all these good things would happen. they get all these blessings. And if they were disobedient, they would have all these curses. And in that, verse 28, lists these same three curses. But here, these curses are being visited, not on Israel, upon her enemies. And the victory they're going to experience will turn out to be a supernatural victory. Continuing verse 5. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. See, God is going to empower Israel and overpower their enemies. In verse 6, In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like the torch of fire in a sheaf. 
And they shall devour all the people round about in the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Now this idiom of using the fire among the sheaves probably should ring familiar to you because you may recall that's exactly the way Samson harassed the Philistines. You remember he tied a firebrand between the tail of two foxes and turned them loose in the Philistines' field and set, you know, set up what we would call a prairie fire, right? And uh, Judges 15, first five verses for those of you that want to refresh your memory. Same thing Absalom did in 2 Samuel 14, if you recall. But of course it's being used here, I think, idiomatically and yet very vividly. It makes a very vivid image. Verse 7, And the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Strange phrase. The Lord is going to deal first with the tents of Judah. That's in contrast, if you will, to the fortifications of the capital. In that day, verse 8, shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Notice here in that day is emphasized twice. And the glory of the house of David is amplified in 2 Samuel 17, 18, several places there. And the angel of the Lord going before them should be familiar to you. Uh, Exodus 23, 32, 33, and so forth. But perhaps the most vivid one is Joshua 5. Who fought the battle of Jericho? What is Joshua? See, you were listening to the music. See, that's, a, that's the danger of being too close to some of these worship teams. You know, you get some false teaching. You thought, I'm kidding, of course. You thought Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. How many thought that? Oh, I got you intimidated now, don't I? Not a hand in the place. Okay. This is one of those fun things. I'm going to digress here a little bit. Uh, let's turn to Joshua chapter 5. Let's find out. It's important for you to know who fought the battle of Jericho for some reasons that may surprise you. Now, you may recall that Joshua crossed the Jordan. First thing he did is have the whole nation circumcised because for 40 years they had not obeyed the Torah. They were not circumcised. I think we all recognize if you're going to do that, it's smart to do it when you're eight days old. Okay? It's a little rough when you're an adult. But in any case, they went through that. Now that's pretty insane. You know, you think about it. He's in a military battle. He's crossed over into enemy territory. And for a number of days, his army is going to be pretty vulnerable. But he's obedient to the Lord. He has them circumcised. But his first campaign is against the capital city of the strongest of the seven tribes that he's facing, Jericho, which means Bet Yara, by the way, which means that moon, house of the moon god. I think it's very interesting that Jericho today is a PLO center. But anyway, they're going to go against the Amorites. But I want you to notice verse 13 of chapter 5. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? Joshua goes up to this guy and challenges him like a sentinel. Now let's see what his response is in verse 14. He said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Well, first of all, this guy claims to be captain of the Lord's host. He's the head of God's armies. Don't let the word captain fool you. We use the term as a field grade officer. The term here is used as the, the big gun. Okay, General might be an equivalent term in our vocabulary. And notice he allows himself to be worshipped. If he's an angel, he's in a lot of trouble, isn't he? There was an angel who allowed himself to be worshipped, right? What was his name? Lucifer, good for you. Verse 15, the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Why did he use that peculiar phrase? Because Joshua would remember that, that the, the last time he used that phrase was out of a burning bush to Joshua's predecessor by the name of Moses. Remember, Joshua went up the hill with him. You may forget that, right? So who is this guy? Jesus. This is an Old Testament appearance. Of, it's sometimes, if you want to give it a fancy name, a theophany. But the point is, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Appearing as an angel. The angel of the Lord. A very special term that's used here. Messenger, special messenger of the Lord. And uh, it's indeed Jesus Christ. 
by the very, you can know, how do you know that? Well, because he's encouraging Joshua to worship him. An angel wouldn't do that. He is the one that's really fighting the battle of Jericho. And uh, it's an interesting study because you'll discover as you study the study of Jericho that almost every law in the Torah is broken. The Ark of the Covenant was not to go to war. It leads the procession. The Levites were excused from military duty, but they're the first tribe in the procession. They're supposed to work six days, rest the seventh. On the seventh day, they do seven times as much. They march around keeping silent until the seventh time they blow the horn and yell and the walls come down. You know the story. And when you get through all of it, there, there's a whole parallel. You'll discover the book of Joshua is a model in anticipation of the book of Revelation. Structurally, in terms of language, and I won't start on that. We'll be here all night on that one. Let's get back to Zechariah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, the house of David shall be as God as the angel of the Lord before them. Now, the angel of the Lord has, appears in a number of their battles. The battle of Jericho being perhaps the most conspicuous. And you get to verse 9. And it shall come to pass when? In that day. There's that phrase again. That I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This is God speaking. This is the ruler of the universe speaking. Is he able to pull this off? Would you want to be among those nations? We're working on it, aren't we? What nations are going to come against Jerusalem? The United States going to be among them? Boy, look at the current administration. It's fascinating. No, seriously. He, he didn't start it. Bush and Baker were, uh, you know, I'm sorry, every bit is bad. I guess the, at least it's a photo finish. Uh, um, I will seek. Interesting word. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 7. You remember the, the steeds that sought to go to and fro all the earth? Their cup of iniquity is full. God is going to deal very summarily to those nations that uh, seek to thwart his purposes in Israel. But the question is, what has happened? What moral and spiritual shift has occurred in Israel that would warrant this change from dispatching enemies against Israel? You know, we go all through the scripture, all through their history. We have the Assyrians or the Babylonians being used by God as a judgment of his people, right? See that all the way through. We see that in the prophetic books too, of things that are coming. But here, God is doing just the opposite. He is going to intervene on their behalf. What change has occurred to uh, cause God to dispatch these forces on, on Israel's behalf? What's involved in this change? And the answer is national conversion. We're not talking about individuals, now. we're talking about the nation. Verse 10 is your key verse of the chapter. A very, very profound, incredible verse. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. You may want to mark it. Where God continues, he says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Really? And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Notice that verb, pour. I will pour. It's a shafak, which uh, is used to indicate a transforming spiritual uh, transaction. You may recall the famous passage in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and following that James, the Lord's brother, quotes in Acts 15. I will pour out my spirit, and so forth. That very famous passage that, um, oh, hang on, I'm getting blanks. Let's, let's, let, let me not muck it up by misquoting it. Turn to Joel. Nothing else that will encourage you to get tabs. I've got a new one here. I've got a little, okay. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, It shall come to pass that afterward I, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my Spirit. Now, James in Acts 2 quotes that at Pentecost. Tomorrow is going to be the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. Well, the Feast of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is when, of course, the, the Spirit descended 
And they all thought these people were drunk because they were speaking these strange languages. We are, they are not drunk, as you suppose, etc. And uh, this is that uh, which uh, Joel spoke of. It doesn't mean that it was fulfilling Joel's prophecy. It's the same thing. that It's the same kind of thing is what he's really saying. So, in any case, I will pour out my spirit. Now, that's in Zechariah 12.10... That's exactly what he's talking about. He's a transforming spiritual condition. And uh, so God has spiritual purposes which must be accomplished in Israel. And the nation is not yet in obedience. The nation today is a secular, humanistic, atheistic nation. There is a religious extremist group in the Knesset that creates all kinds of problems. But uh, they are certainly not in a position of obedience to the Torah or the Word of God. And they certainly don't have trust in their Messiah. Now the prophet Zechariah is now setting forth very vividly, he's going, the rest of the chapter is going to deal with the conversion of Israel. This has yet to happen. This is obviously yet future. Now I will pour out upon whom? Upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I'm going to suggest to you that's a metonym for the entire nation. When you speak of it's the house of David, you speak of the capital, you're em- embracing in that the entire covenant people. Pour out the spirit of grace and supplications. Both grace and supplications are derived from the same Hebrew root, kanan, which means mercy, gracious, merciful, supplication. That is an Old Testament idiom for the Holy Spirit. And uh, you're going to pour out the spirit of grace and supplications. And this is a reference to the Holy Spirit in all His influences. You'll see this in Ezekiel 39, 29. We just saw it in Joel 2, 28 and 29, and um, so forth. Now, this is also, let's tie this to the New Testament. Hold your place here and turn to Romans. You may recall, we talked about in Luke 19, when Jesus is riding the donkey to Jerusalem, and he weeps over the city because he knew they were going to reject him. And he says, if you'd only recognize this thy day, the things which belong to your peace. But now they are hidden from thine eyes. He, in effect, closes blindfolds them going forward to the reality of the Messiah. They rejected him, so these, he adjudicates blindness upon them. Forever know. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, deals with this. Paul spends three chapters hammering away that God is not finished with Israel. It's amazing how many churches teach from the pulpits that the church has replaced Israel in some sense. That's heresy. The promises to Israel are unique to Israel. The promises to the church are quite distinctive. No, they don't confuse the two. That's, that's the beginning of anti-Semitism in, 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 within the body. God has a program for Israel. He's not through yet. Paul spends three chapters hammering away that God is not finished with Israel. In chapter 11, that's 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 11, verse 25, it comes to a climax. Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until, see that word, until, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Strange phrase. Apparently, the Holy Spirit is calling out a people out of the Gentiles for himself, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. When that body is complete and come in, Israel's blindness is relieved. See, blindness in part has happened to Israel until... Great word. Study the untils in the Bible. Those are milestones on a perch chart. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until... The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. From this and a number of other places, there are some of us that believe that the church will be gathered up prior to the events we're reading about. God seems to deal with Israel and the church mutually exclusively. Israel's blinded, opens the door to the church. The whole church period lasted virtually 2,000 years. That door, when that door closes, God will again deal with the planet earth in respect to Israel. Continuing, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. When? After the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Follow me? That's what it's saying. So shall all Israel be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And on he goes. Very exciting. 
Very exciting. So this is what we're seeing dramatized here in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Now, you can't miss. They're going to say, it says, And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Boy, oh boy. They're going to go into repentance and confession. Now, question. Did these that are seeing him, yet future, right? Did they themselves pierce the Messiah? Indeed, they did in the sense of their unbelief and the rejection of him. They made the deeds of their ancestors their own. Hold your place here and refresh your memory on John chapter 19, verse 37. In John 19, we're before the cross. The Romans have uh, nailed the Lord Jesus Christ to these 12 by 12s or whatever they were. And uh, when you get down here to oh, say about uh, verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They broke not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear did what? Pierced his side. And immediately there came out blood and water. And he that saw it bore witness, and his witness is true. And he knoweth that he saith is true, that he, he might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled... A bone of him should not be broken. That comes from Exodus 12, that the Passover lamb was not to have a bone broken. Psalm 34, 20 also points out that not a bone of the Messiah would be broken, etc. So, interestingly enough, these Roman soldiers, unknowingly, were fulfilling prophecy. How accommodating of them. But verse 37 is our target. And again, another scripture said, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Where is that quoted from? Zechariah 12, 10. You got it. Right on. But in an elliptical sense, if you will. Now, the confession that Israel will make is detailed in Isaiah chapter 52, starting at about verse 13. In Isaiah 52, we have what some people call the uh, Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. What do you mean be very high? Jesus told Nicodemus that as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, remember? In Numbers uh, 24, I think it is, wherever, they had the uh, plague of, of these uh, serpents. And uh, God told Moses to put a brass serpent on a pole, and anyone that looked to it would be healed. Strange remedy. Well, you're going to heal something. I mean, you know, what's going on here? Well, God is also developing an object lesson. It's explained for us, but Jesus explains it to Nicodemus. As Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Be raised up the same way. So that brass serpent becomes a symbol of Jesus Christ. What a strange symbol of Jesus Christ. A brass serpent? Why a brass serpent? Well, what is a serpent a symbol of? Sin or the curse. And what is brass, Levitically, or bronze? It is judgment, because it's the metal that could sustain fire. So uh, it represents sin judged. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that he was made sin for us. And that's what Jesus is, as the Son of Man is lifted up. And that's exactly, in effect, what Isaiah is echoing here. He shall be exalted and be very high. And many were astounded at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. And I won't get behind that verse, that's mistranslated. He was beaten so badly, he hardly looked human, is what it really says. So shall he sprinkle many nations, the king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them, shall they see. And that which they had not heard, shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up a form as a tender plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Hear this from Israel as they get confronted with the one who they pierced. Is that correct? Surely he hath borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Fascinating passage in Isaiah. The Ashkenazi Jews removed it from their copy of Isaiah, but they're embarrassed in 1947 with the Dead Sea Scrolls where they found an intact copy of Isaiah. And right in the middle of it, guess what? There's Isaiah 53 staring them in the face. Now, one of the things you'll encounter in Judaism is the theory of two messiahs, as they recognize in their own text that there's a messiah that is uh, to rule and there's a messiah to suffer and die. So they invent this theory of two messiahs, one to die and one to reign. That's an invention of the rabbis with no foundation in the scripture. And it's, uh, it's to explain some of these passages. These two messiahs are sometimes referred to as the Messiah ben David and the Mashiach ben uh, Joseph. Messiah, the son of David, the Messiah, the son of Joseph. And this idea emerged, no one can quite tell where it started, somewhere in the first and second century A.D. And it became very much rooted in the Talmud in the third century. And uh, many of these uh, references are confused and inconsistent. And uh, now the answer to this, of course, of these two ad- are actually two advents of one Messiah, as we clearly recognize. It's fascinating to attend a conference in Jerusalem. I remember when, uh, uh, I won't mention his name so I can speak clearly, a rabbi, a close friend of ours, was explaining this whole two uh, Messiah theory. And it's amazing how one is to be born in Bethlehem and uh, one riding a donkey. I mean, all these passages, but allocated to two different guys. And you hear this, you can't understand. If they know all that, don't they recognize that it all occurred in one person? But only by the Holy Spirit, of course. Now, the oldest interpreters of these passages, I mean, in the Scripture, both Jewish and Christian, understood it. But when they were oppressed by the Christian arguments about the Old Testament prophecies of the suffering of the Messiah, this fiction about uh, Messiah ben Yosef was offered as a, a welcome means of escape. And um, the ill-fated rebellion of Bar Kokhba in 132-135 A.D., when he was, uh, this false prophet, was, a false Messiah, was uh, uh, killed by the Romans, finally, uh, their aspirations were quenched in blood. And uh, so this, con- this contrivance was kindled to uh, give them hope. But there are many passages that refute this view. We read the Isaiah passage as one example. Daniel chapter 9, the last four verses, the famed 70 week prophecy, also refutes this view, and Ezekiel does. Hosea chapter 3 also does. They shall have no king but, uh, uh, until they seek the son of David. But there's no passage that makes it more clear than this one. Because here clearly is the one that's defeating their enemies, and yet he's the one they pierced. I mean, it ties it all together. So Zechariah 12.10 is pretty interesting. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him. The word bitterness, marar, to be bitter. I'm reminded in Ruth, those of you, uh, after all, Feast of Shavuot tomorrow, everybody should be studying the book of Ruth. One of the most interesting books of prophecy in the Old Testament. There's no book of prophecy more relevant to the New Testament. You will not understand Revelation 5 unless you understand the book of Ruth. But in Ruth 1.20, remember when Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. She says, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. Mara. Call me Mara. Bitter. The word Mary or Mara means bitterness. It's interesting that Naomi has to return to the land before Boaz can become the kinsman redeemer. It's kind of interesting to see that obviously Israel has to return to the land before all these things can happen. What's been going on since 1948? 
back in the land. Kind of, well, I should say, actually, since the end of the 19th century, but climaxed, of course, with the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Is something biblically relevant going on? You bet. Breathtaking. Now, once they recognize the one they rejected, they will manifest their true repentance by mourning of the most forceful and intense kind. The kind of grief you would have for a firstborn son. Verse 11. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddo. See, in verse 10 we have domestic grief. In verse 11 we have a public calamity. Now the that that day should be great mourning as the mourning of Hadram. What it's referring to is a historical calamity. That's when the hope of Israel at one time was Josiah. And he was killed at Megiddo by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. And that, the loss of that was the last ray of hope for the nation that led them drift into the captivity ultimately of Babylon. You'll find that Second Kings 23 or Second Chronicles 35 really gets into the agony of the nation. When Josiah was killed at Megiddo, the, the morning that went through, they knew it was over. That was their last ray of hope. And that sorrow must have been incredible at that time to be in effect a point of comparison for the morning that's yet future. Do you follow me? It foreshadowed in a sense of speaking the grief in, uh, that they're going to express here. Mahedad Rimen, by the way, is a compound of two Syrian idols or gods from Second Kings 5.18 and elsewhere. It's also the name of a town or, uh, about four miles on the plain of Israel and about four miles southwest of Megiddo on the plain. And it's very, uh, Megiddo, of course, is very famous in Israel's history for lots of reasons. You may recall that's where Jabin and the 900 chariots were overwhelmed. That's where Gideon's 300 defeated the Amalekites and the Midianites and the children of the east. So that's where Samson triumphed over the Philistines. That's where Barak and Deborah uh, defeated Sisera. And that's where uh, Saul was slain by the Philistines, right, essentially there. And um, Ahaziah was uh, slain by the arrows of Jehu. And, of course, Josiah was slain by uh, Pharaoh Necho, as I've mentioned. But that's famous for another reason. The reason it's echoing here, it's sort of a preliminary tremor, rhetorically speaking, because Megiddo is also the site of Revelation 16, 16, which, among other things, describes the blood being as deep as the horse's bridles. So that's forthcoming. We'll touch more on that in chapter 13. But moving on. Verse 12. And the land shall mourn, every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. And verse 13. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. And the valley of Shammai apart, and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Now it speaks of David, and Nathan, and Levi, and Shammai. The house of David, of course, is, speaks perhaps of the king. The house of Nathan, of the prophet. And the um, house of Levi, the priests. And Shammai is the non... Uh, he was actually the son of Gershon, of a non-priest Levi, if you will. Now, that's one possibility. The other theory might be it wasn't Nathan the prophet, it was Nathan the younger son of David. And if so, that might be speaking to the branch that Luke takes in chapter 3 of David's lineage that goes to Mary rather than Joseph, interestingly enough. But whatever. In each case, though, we have intense sorrow. We're talking private and public, national and individual, personal and family. And the deepest grief always seeks seclusion. And the language, I suspect, refers to this, the families remain, every family apart and the wives apart. Everybody alone, grieving, as they realize their predicament, as they repent of the rejection of their Messiah. And this is on a national basis, but down the individual. Very, very interesting. Who's doing the work here? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. See, it says, they shall look it says upon me in your English, but the word in the Hebrew is look unto me. 
And the model is very similar to Numbers 21.9, that was we talked about the brazen serpent. As you look unto the brazen serpent, you were healed of the plague of the vipers there in, in uh, Numbers 21. And uh, in uh, John 3, as Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the brazen altar in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Meaning we have to look unto Him. And Israel will come to the knowledge of their sins by looking unto her rejected and her pierced Messiah, the crucified Savior of sinners. This here details, of course, the national conversion of Israel, which is a preamble to chapters 13 and 14. The book of Revelation, from chapter 4 through chapter 19, I believe, is a detailing of a series of events that will occur in that period of time that Gabriel highlighted to Daniel in the last four verses of Daniel 9. In that passage, he detailed 70 weeks of years, 69 of them, an interval of time, and then a 70th. The 69 weeks of years climaxed to the exact day, the presentation of Jesus Christ as king to Jerusalem that they rejected on that famed Palm Sunday. Gabriel detailed verse 26 of that four-verse prophecy. Start at verse 24, which deals with scope 25, which deals with 69 of those weeks. Then verse 26 deals with the interval between that rejection of the Messiah and a final seven-year period. What's going to happen, we believe, is that uh, Israel obviously going to be, be uh, uh, converted. But the details of that 70th week, that seven-year period in the book of Revelation is laid out from chapter 4 through chapter 19 in great detail. We're also going to discover that those same events are described or portrayed, if you will, in the, next two, the final two chapters of the book of Zechariah, chapters 13 and 14.